Okay, and with that, we are now at um, our final session for the day. Um, welcome back. Um, we will now be focusing on research data um, and metrics needs and are really excited to bring you um, our final session. Uh, research questions, data collection, and, and monitoring efforts are essential to strengthening the evidence base for our response to the crisis. Um, today, we'll be hearing from our working group, which is centered on this, uh, on this very topic, and they'll share important updates um, on where critical research is still needed. Um, the presentation today will be delivered by our working group co-leads, who are Dr. Carlos Blanco, who is Director of the Division of Epidemiology, Services, and Prevention Research at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, a component of the National Institutes of Health, and Dr. Kelly Clark, who is immediate past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And of course, joining our co-leads for our session today, our expert panel of reactors. Um, we have Dr. Hilary Cunnins, who is the executive deputy commissioner of mental hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Stephen Miller, who is the Chief Clinical Officer at Cigna, and Dr. Richard Platt, who is a Professor and Chair of the Department of Population Health and President of the Harvard Fulcrum Healthcare Institute. Their full biographies are available on the event website for you to access. We're really excited um, to be in this session, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Clark, who will begin the presentation. I am trying to unmute. Hopefully I'm there now. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, take some of your time today to uh, let you know what we've been doing in the research data and metrics working group of the collaborative. Uh, over the past two years, the collaborative has been working to accelerate the national response to the opioid epidemic. Uh, the, um, we've been doing this by really bringing together uh, as you've seen today, a wide range of stakeholders who often are not at the table together. And as has been mentioned multiple times, that's extremely important for dealing with an issue that is as multifactorial as our overdose death crisis. The research data and metrics group is focused on the need to delineate research data metric needs and the opportunities across um, each of the three work groups that you've already heard from today, as well as for uh, to get these um, questions and identify these gaps and needs more broadly. Um, so our process of doing this was one of uh, working with each of the work groups, but also uh, getting information from uh, members of the collaborative and all of the affiliated organizations to really cast a wide net to see what information do we really need and then to prioritize these into some buckets uh, to really help drive uh, a focus for funding and for research allocation and resource allocation, not, not just dollars, but resource allocation for all of the organizations that have an ability to address some of these high priority gaps that we have identified. And you'll see as you look at our panelists of, of uh, folks who are going to be reacting um, that we have payers here as well because uh, often people don't understand the, the wide range of data that payers have in their claims data and in, in other mechanisms that can really be utilized to make uh, information that can help us drive better policy, better patient care, and base better outcomes. So our goal for research data and metrics, which was made up from individuals who were on the other work groups, was to come up with a cross-cutting uh, and cross-collaborative research agenda, collating these high priority evidence gaps and research questions. Um, and then to put this out in a publication that can help focus those, those critical uh, resources toward our critical needs. Next slide, please. So as, we, as we've worked through this, um, we have also paid attention to the things we've been discussing today, uh, the COVID-19 and our 
need to better focus on health disparities and social determinants of health. And, and uh, this is, you'll see, uh, as uh, the work of the collaborative in this particular work group becomes uh, more available, is really baked into uh, the way that we have uh, looked at these priorities uh, and are, are going to put these out here. Next slide, please. So in speaking briefly through each of the, uh, the, the different work groups and some of the, some of the uh, information and, uh, that came in um, from other uh, uh, members of the co uh, collaborative, not just those who are within the work groups, I'm gonna just talk through these today in terms of the primary work groups. And you'll see when, when uh, this is made public, the full document, how broad these, this uh, research agenda is. But to look at some of the general buckets in the focus on health professional education and training, as we've discussed so many times today here that inadequate education and training is, is contributing to these practice gaps in both pain management and the treatment of opiate use disorder and other substance use disorders um, across all professions and all kinds of clinical settings. Um, and what we're hoping here is these research priorities will serve to facilitate a harmonized and interprofessional health education uh, systems approach, which of course is going to be uh, uh, critical to have an impactful uh, uh, response. And so the first thing you'll see here is basically to support the ongoing identification of the health professional practice gaps and to what's been said several times earlier, if we're not looking at it, if we're not measuring it, if we don't have a process in place to, to put it in our scope and our line of sight, it doesn't happen. So just starting off by into, by continuing to identify, by putting into place processes to identify these educational gaps, this is really the first step that will allow for iterative and, and consistent improvement um, in the uh, identifying and then addressing the kinds of additional data that we need. And secondly, fostering the educational research and scholarship that advances uh, effective educational tools and interventions. In some, in some areas, we know quite a bit about what are the best ways to train. Um, and we are missing some of the, uh, making that happen <laughs> uh, throughout the, the wide range of, of uh, education. And so some of the gaps in, in, uh, in that, what's getting in the way of that implementation and et cetera, you'll see those kinds of, of uh, issues come up uh, as a priority. And then finally, uh, improving that entire educational infrastructure and the data sharing. Uh, our health system is incredibly siloed, as we know. And so uh, is the educational system and the credentialing system. All clinicians are licensed by states. And the, uh, the differences between states in how they license and certify individuals to perform different services is enormous. So looking at, uh, at, at those issues, gathering data on those issues to try to uh, identify where the gaps are there that really need to be identified further is also very key in uh, the focus on a health professional education and training. Next slide, please. In the next group, the pain management guidelines and evidence standards. Now here, this is the focus uh, area where, as we've discussed, the widespread effective pain management is pro programs and systems are going to be necessary it, for us in the future to both prevent a cycle of people who have been become addicted or misusing opioids in addition to those who are dependent on opioids, just physically dependent and are at risk for premature death and morbidity problems simply because of their dosage of sedating medications, including opioids. We're going to need to put that kind of a program into place and systems into place for prevention in the future, but also to treat people who are dealing with chronic pain now without simply uh, essentially over medicating them as had been done in the past. So a few things are a few large buckets um, came out in uh, the discussion of where our evidence gaps are. Uh, and those those uh, you can see on the slide here. So one is really evaluating 
um, pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapies for chronic pain, for acute pain uh, and chronic pain. Uh, and again, there's been a lot of data on this in the past and some of uh, what we will focus on in the uh, research agenda is, again, those gaps uh, from what we know works to systems that are not focused on making that work. And how do we make that implementation work in the future? A, a huge issue for us to deal with from a, a policy and patient care standpoint. Again, the understanding and addressing the gaps in prevention and treatment of pain. Um, we have had a, a number of unintended consequences from some practice guidelines in the past, uh, of which the clinicians on this webinar, I'm sure, are aware. Um, and some of the unintended consequences of our COVID policies uh, have also been uh, made clear more recently. An increase in overdoses, uh, looks like an increase in overdose deaths, an increase in thoughts of suicidality, a decrease in people who are willing to go in and, and engage in non-pharmacological treatments, physical therapy, et cetera, uh, because of COVID. And so investigating this as well and how we can uh, counter that is going to be very important for us. And then the, the lead off topic here is additional research additional uh, training on tapering people who have been on chronic high dose opioids or just chronic opioids. Um, as you know, the National Academy has put out a, a paper on this, but the amount of data is, um, is in desperate need of, uh, of increasing, as well as the training of patients and, and the professionals uh, in really focusing on what the outcomes are for treating chronic pain and so on. So you'll see this is one of our large buckets as well in the research priorities. Next slide, please. In the prevention, treatment and recovery group, here we are um, focusing on a, a number of, of issues that fall into these kinds of buckets as well. So again, collecting and assessing the, the data on demographics, social determinants, special populations, and and really identifying how people are managing to how people are managing to get into evidence-based care, what's keeping them from getting into evidence-based care, um, and what the outcomes are when those uh, between those kinds of groups, the availability of, of access and the quality of care that can be accessed for prevention, treatment, and recovery services uh, services for patients with opioid use disorder. This has is integral to combating our overdose epidemic. And the access and quality of these services has consistently been inadequate throughout the history of treatment uh, prevention in, in the United States. Um, and this perpetuates this cycle. So identifying these barriers between best practices that are relevant to, to prevention and treatment, um, and then over, how best to overcome those barriers is absolutely uh, uh, imperative. Um, I, just to a, a comment from the last discussion, I have seen some of the absolute worst treatment in, in my experience for, from treatment programs that are either cash only, and I don't even mean self-pay, I mean cash, or uh, accept only commercial health plans and then bill out of network uh, for with an enormous amount of fraud, waste, and abuse. Our access to quality care uh, problem is very difficult. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the response for the, uh, the paper that uh, the, uh, we've been working on in prevention, treatment, and recovery on those four Cs as well to help drive that forward. But identifying these barriers and how to overcome them is a, a key research gap. Um, likewise in there is the challenges between for for uh, care transitions and the care transitions here very broadly and including the justice system uh, as people are moving through the justice system for justice involved persons extremely key so you'll see a number of priorities in these areas next slide please then uh, also are evaluating these initiatives to facilitate greater access. So not just access to quality care, but access in general. How do we get people in the front door? Um, 
And then how do we make sure that what they're getting once they walk through the door is quality and appropriate treatment that's helpful and not harmful or useless. And some of this is around uh, uh, discussing more about a stigma, but also you know, educating people about what that looks like and so forth. You'll see that in the priorities. And then finally, very importantly now during COVID-19, uh, our telemedicine services that are related to accessing treatment as well as recovery support services um, and prevention uh, interventions uh, that have some of, some of the rules and regulations have changed during uh, COVID. Uh, they can change back immediately uh, with, with the stroke of a pen. Um, and really identifying which of these have been helpful, um, how they've been helpful, uh, a very difficult piece of work to do, uh, but extremely important work to do. And you'll see a number of priorities around there. So I hope I've summarized adequately uh, where we've been uh, so far. And now I'll turn it over to my co-chair here, Carlos Blanco, to talk about where we're going. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Yeah, so as Kelly, as Kelly was saying, uh, we've done a lot of a lot of work in the last um, two years, and of course, the credit goes not only to the research group but really to the whole collaborative because we've been really more like a funnel that has really collated and coordinated what other groups other groups have done, and and much of that has already been presented um, in the previous uh, sessions of this webinar. So what we want to do um, moving into the future is take this agenda, which at this point is mostly intellectual content and turn it into practice. And so we have to do several steps or we propose several steps to do that. One, of course, um, the first step is to, to increase awareness where the critical gaps in research data and metrics persist and also identify where we have enough knowledge that we don't want to put additional resources. The second uh, probably priority is to start um, getting the action collaborative members and the network organizations to identify priorities that are relevant to them and may be important for, for them or for us to, to implement. And at the same time that the um, members and the network organizations start to implement those initiatives to identify what are barriers and facilitators for that implementation. Next. And, and the idea in, uh, in doing that, of course, is to, to create what the National Academy has really spearheaded over the last few years, which is to develop a learning healthcare system or more broadly, a learning um, care system. Some of other things that we have to do is um, probably bring these priorities outside our sort of silos. It would not be that useful in our opinion to just present research priorities to researchers because of course, researchers always think that further research is needed. So what we need to do is go to other organizations, the places where we want the research to be implemented and engage in a dialogue with the organizations and the systems um, that are going to, to take advantage of this research. And at the same time, listen to them and see what other priorities are important that we may not have identified. We also want to ensure that uh, there's enough funding for pilots and for projects and those uh, and that funding can come from uh, traditional funders like um, federal funding agencies or private organizations, but potentially from the systems that may benefit from those um, changes and from that, from that uh, research. We also want as a research group and in collaboration with the rest of the action collaborative to monitor the progress. So as I said, identify barriers and facilitators and also facilitate the diffusion of findings, tools and resources that might be identified during these sort of learning uh, process. And then also identify the potential case studies that may best exemplify some of the findings and resources that the collaborative and the uh, network organizations may have identified. So with that, I want to turn it to the reactor panel. And I believe Hillary, you're the first one who is going to give us some feedback about how we can do things better. Um, thanks so much, uh, both Carlos and Kelly, and thanks um, to the Academy for, for inviting me to, to react to what is a very comprehensive um, 
plan. Uh, you gave me good homework, so thank you. Um, I, I enjoyed reading and thinking about this. Um, first, let me just start with a few thoughts about just some feedback on the overall frame. And I, I'm sorry, I missed much of the preceding conversation. I caught the end of the last panel. So perhaps some of these issues have been discussed. Um, it was clear to me from reading the research um, section of the report uh, that the group had considered the issues deeply and thoroughly. Um, and so my comments are really, I would say some tweaks around, around the margins. Uh, I'm also describing issues that I think are of high priority for us in New York City from the public and population health point of view as I'm speaking from New York City Health Department. First, um, I appreciated the inclusion of the need to do research uh, on different policy and approaches that might, for example, incentivize, incentivize more effective care or strategies. One comment, and I know this is uh, difficult from a research point of view, is we exist in a multi-part, as you all know, policy agenda with some combination of payer policies, regulation, uh, legislation that, that drives regulation. And part of the research challenge to me as a policymaker and public health official is, what is the right combination and strategies together that can drive system change, whether it's, um, and, and ultimately to drive better health and public health outcomes. Uh, one incredible example that we learned during COVID, in fact, is how policies can change on a dime and what and, and combinations of policies can be implemented that profoundly affect the way we deliver and, and use care. The next comment is that about um, tackling uh, structural racism. And it's clear from the document and from the preceding conversation that this has been central uh, to the committee's work. Um, I wanted to just offer uh, in the research domain the extent to which uh, the consequences of structural racism are borne out through the many different systems that touch folks. And the thing that I know best is uh, folks with substance use disorders or who are using illicit drugs. And so the cross-sector research that can happen across, for example, our social service system, as well as our criminal justice system to understand both the intended and unintended consequences of policies and practices. So for example, well-intended diversion from law enforcement setting could result in increasing surveillance from a, a criminal justice point of view and worsened health as well as social outcomes because of protracted entanglement with what is at the outset relatively well-meaning criminal justice uh, providers. Third um, is that uh, in the research agenda, I noted a focus on engagement strategies and I've just heard this in Kelly's comments as well. I would provide feedback that this issue of how to engage folks who are from a behavior change point of view, maybe pre-contemplative or contemplative is a major both clinical and policy task. What are the right interventions or combinations of interventions that can change important health outcomes by using strategies of engagement rather than formal treatment? I include in that, and I know it's mentioned in your document, is the centrality of peer delivered support and interventions. This is an area that has exploded in use with, in my view, um, not enough research to really understand the right package or combination of strategies uh, in terms of measuring its impact. Lastly, I just wanna mention two other more clinically oriented um, important research topics, which I didn't see mentioned and would be fantastic to include. One is using uh, incorporating functional outcomes into care, both for folks with chronic pain and with substance use disorder. 
really to move us away from sort of this hyper focus on, in the substance use case, people's urine toxicology, in the chronic pain case, from, from their dosing of their opioid or other things, because ultimately it's these outcomes that matter to, to people and, and to the people caring for them. I know it is hard as a former primary care doctor, addiction medicine doctor, to operationalize that easily. And that feels to me like an area for further development. And then finally, I just want to mention the importance of trauma as an antecedent cause of both substance use and chronic pain um, adverse outcomes. And this is an area, at least from the public health point of view, about how do we both implement and then scale interventions that address trauma and have the potential to, sh to change people's outcomes in both of these domains. I diverted from the questions you asked me, but I hope they are embedded in what I said. Thanks very much. Thanks, Hilary. No, fantastic, uh, fantastic, <clears throat> fantastic comments. You have not pointed us, so thanks very much. And Richard, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. I, I have to say that I was just delighted to see the uh, research agenda that you developed. Uh, not only is it comprehensive, uh, but it is so clearly uh, resonant with the National Academy of Medicine's articulation of a learning health system, one in which the development of evidence is deeply embedded in the delivery of care and, and then, and, and then, a system that actually adopts best practice in a, in a timely manner. So, um, uh, so I thought that was perfect in that regard. So I'm going to provide uh, comments um, from um, the perspective of an investigator, really. Um, and and I would say, had we had this discussion ten years ago, I would have said. It, the, the task is uh, the task is enormous, and we might not be able to, uh, to to make serious progress. And I'm happy to say that that there there are there are important um, important programs and learnings that we can draw on to advance this. Uh, first, uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health Healthcare Systems Research Collaboratory is the home of six or seven demonstration projects that are, uh, will teach us a lot about doing this kind of research. Each of them is a, approximately a $5 million investment on the part of the NIH and is, uh, is testing something important that's consistent with this research agenda. Some of it is uh, non-opioid mechanisms of, uh, of addressing pain, uh, acupuncture, TENS, uh, um, uh, guided relaxation. Some of it is talking about uh, the environment in which you deliver care, uh, collaborative uh, care models. Some of it is talking about the, the locations in which you deliver care, emergency departments, uh, uh, hematology clinics, uh, and, and the like. And, and what is coming out of those is, is something that I, I, I suppose we should have expected, which is doing this kind of research to develop hard evidence that can be transported to other systems is, uh, is a substantial undertaking. So the good news is there are good examples of uh, ways to develop and implement this research, and we should expect it to, be, uh, uh, to, to take all of the expertise and talent that our national research uh, system can develop. The second thing I'll say is from the perspective of um, the, uh, of PCORI's PCORNet, the Patient-Centered Research Network, there are 80, 80 clinical sites around the country that are well positioned to uh, both to do research and to, uh, uh, and to do it in a way that uh, draws on a, uh, a, a high quality curated data from each of these sites and the ability for uh, for individuals in these sites and external investigators to work not just with their data, but to reach out to uh, clinicians and, the, and providers in the delivery system and to the patients who, for whom they care. So there is a platform on which to uh, build nation-scale interventions. Uh, 
And finally, from my perspective as the uh, principal investigator of the FDA Sentinel system, I can say we have a, a national view into practice. So, so Kelly, you, you appropriately talked about the big problems with siloed data. And FDA has, has made a, a 12-year investment in building a system that was intended for to support regulatory decision-making around marketed medical products, but is also capable of, uh, of observing uh, practice that was quite useful for the, the work that we're talking about. Sentinel is now actively monitoring the, uh, uh, the, the care of 70 million people that comes largely from the, uh, the largest commercial payers in the U.S., uh, from uh, from uh, Kaiser Permanente and from uh, from fee for service Medicare. We also have Sentinel has a partnership with HCA Healthcare and so has a window into being able to monitor the inpatient care of five percent of the hospitalizations in the U.S. Um, and this is not just a possibility, but FDA has uh, has had Sentinel evaluate uh, the use of opioids in a variety of settings. For instance, to look at the uh, number of days of opioid treatment dispensed to patients who uh, have had surgery and are being discharged to home. So there's uh, there's a lot. Of, so my my take home message is there's a lot to build on, and uh, and I, I just think that there's so much upside potential for the research agenda that you described. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And uh, next, uh, Steve, would you like to make some remarks? Yeah, thank you, Carlos, and thanks for having me. So I want to first uh, take the opportunity to thank the Academy uh, for this great seminar and the great amount of work you all have put in over the last couple of years. Uh, and the dialogue today has really been outstanding. And the framework of the four C's really spectacular, the readings that were out there. And so I get incredibly energized because I don't think about these things every day like many of you do. And so as a payer, I find the progress just tremendous. Uh, but I also want to speak specifically of the, yeah, from a payer. But remember at Cigna, we are a unique company in that we are mostly a commercial payer. And in the United States, you have multiple payment systems. You have Medicare, you have Medicaid, and you have commercial. And each of them is a totally different system. And then on top of it, we actually have the privilege of being in 30 different countries. And so we see the use of pain medications across 30 different countries. And when we do our own research, we see this incredible variability. And there's many lessons to be learned internationally that we need to bring into the US system because most other countries don't use pain medications the way we do, and therefore don't have the same degree of the problem that we have here in the United States. And so I think there's a lot to be learned from outside the country, but I want to be very pragmatic from a commercial payer. And that is when you look at the research agenda and you look at what we need, we put it in a couple buckets. Number one is if I'm going to change policies and what is it that you are, are advocating for me to do when it comes to pain management? So if we take pain management as a pre addiction problem, what is it specifically that I'm supposed to do policy-wise to make sure that I'm using the best providers and the best providers are using pain medications and non-pain medications in the best way possible so that I prevent the problem from the upstream? The second is then when someone is on pain medicines, how do I prevent them from becoming addicted? Short of putting in PAs and very strict quantity level limits, which have been shown to be effective. But what am I supposed to do? And so what's the research agenda around that? The third is around the treatment agenda. And so the research of what's best for treatment. Right now, I can tell you that the frustration for the payers is I use any care provider, not best care providers. I have trouble building a network of best care providers. And even then I have bad metrics on what is best care. And so I need a research agenda that helps me identify what is good, what's bad, because as you heard earlier, I'm more than happy to pay for good treatment. I wanna quit paying for bad treatment. And right now I know as a fact that I'm paying for a lot of bad treatment. 
And I know that that money is arbitrageable. I can actually move that money to good treatment, but I need you all in your research agenda for me to identify what is good treatment and why is it that every one of my patients actually gets into a system of care that doesn't provide the full spectrum of care. The only care I get is what the service provider actually offers. If they offer methadone, my patients are getting methadone. If they offer MAT, they're getting MAT. If they get, offer Vivitrol, they're getting Vivitrol. But I'm not being able to select what's best. It's just what the patient falls into. And then finally, the issue of recidivism and people, how do I keep, once I get my patient successfully treated, how do I keep them successfully treated? So I love the research agenda. It's incredibly comprehensive. And the issues of social determinants of health and other things are truly really important because we see failures based on all those things. The final thing is just an offer. That is, we sit on a ton of data. And while data, especially when it comes to behavioral health is really difficult to access because of different rules and regulations and permissions that go with that versus other things, we wanna be a research partner. So for anyone on this call, if you want, think that we can be of assistance in providing a tool for research, we want to be able to do it. I can't tell you how incredibly excited I am for participating today, for making it, for me getting educated uh, on many of these issues and congratulations to the great work you're doing, but we're at the start of this, not at the end. So thanks for having me. Oh, terrific. Well, thank you all for your responses. We have a few minutes left for some discussion. Um, first, I, I, let me just respond to, to something I think you just said, um, Stephen, which is around, you know, how do you know what the, what the care is and you want to uh, pay for that? What you saw in this research agenda, too, is taking a look at how are we certifying from state to state. Treatment programs are absolutely erratically certified. You don't, you know, what is called a, a quote rehab in one state is radically different from what is, is it's called in another state. And I think you see some of, uh, to your point, um, some of this reflected in the research uh, agenda, but also in the paper using Dr. Corey Waller's four C's construct about that consistency and those needs to certify consistently across the board so we can help build that database that we need. Um, so that you're comparing, you know, apples to apples and not apples to prunes, which is what happens so often. So I think some of the things that you've um, given some feedback on, you'll be pleased to see the collaborative is moving forward with um, addressing in some of the uh, some of the publications you'll be seeing seeing soon. So instead of my asking a question at the moment, which I will do if you don't step up, let me ask a panelist: Do you have a question of? your other panelist by something that they said. Giving you the option. I'll, I'll ask a question. I think- Hillary, was, go. Um, <laughs> uh, of something Steve said when you, I'm not gonna get the word quite right, when you could arbitrage uh, money, I guess, across uh, different providers. Um, how, in what way do, would you do that as as a payer, and and you and how would you use research or outcomes to to do that? Yeah, so great question, Hillary. So what you do is you essentially say, I'm going to create a network of what I think are best providers. So I need your res or the research to be able to identify what defines a good provider and then a bad or and a non good provider. I then go to my data, I see which of the providers meet that criteria, which ones don't. I essentially say, I'm going to pay provider A, B, and C better because they're achieving better. And I'm going to quit referring patients and quit paying uh, providers, you know, F, G, and H because they're not succeeding. Right now, because I don't have good metrics, and I'm actually desperate just to get anyone to see my patients. I pay them all the same. And that's just, that's, that's bad healthcare policy. We should not be paying the same for bad care and good care. And so we need to shift that money to the good providers. The other thing I wanna say is that, and I 
failed to mention this during my comments. We have got to change the model. We're, we don't have enough providers out there. We have got to figure out how to be able to do more virtual care and digital care if we're going to be successful because long term, I just don't have enough people to see all the patients that need help. And again, that gets to the capacity issue. Uh, we've never invested in an uh, training of clinicians uh, throughout the entire clinical uh, spectrum, uh, as well as to uh, Dr. Kunin's point about uh, the research on uh, the utilization of peer specialists and other kinds of recovery support uh, interventions in order to have enough evidence-based providers out there to meet the need. And it's a critical piece of infrastructure that is not in place currently, which is something that the collaborative is addressing in these documents that I've uh, spoken of, that others have spoken of that are, are uh, in the process of moving toward publication. Um, and really, since we're, we're looking at infrastructure building and the necessity to, to deal with our deaths from COVID-19, we are not going to be able to make that impact on, on COVID-19 if we're not attending to all of these factors simultaneously. But I'm, I'm pleased to tell you that there is some work on that that you will be seeing coming out of the collaborative here, here shortly. I think I'm coming toward the end of my time. How, let me keep me honest. Do I have time for an additional question? Kelly, you, you sure do. You have until about 2.10, so. I have three minutes. Excellent. <laughs> well, then I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to that, the, the question uh, from the prior discussion, which I think is always an excellent uh, question. Um, and you each get the better part of a minute, but it is, if there's the one thing we need to do, and let me take this from beyond just the research uh, data metrics group and broaden it to everyone, um, to, to the totality of the collaborative. If there's one thing that you would ta are taking today uh, from your involvement in this, this entire day that strikes you that you would like to see us do, what would that one thing be? And I'm gonna start with Hillary because she always has a list of 20 things. So I'm let you start. <laughs> I do. No, worst I one. Do. <laughs> um, I think the one, the one thing is to think about innovation in the engagement domain to pull people into care as of highest priority and someone reflected, how do you, I think you did Kelly, how do you get people to walk in a door, but maybe it's not a door, maybe it's a street corner or maybe it's mm -hmm. a non-traditional setting. How do we think outside of our, our um, delivery systems in order to move needles on health outcomes around opioid use disorder? Great, Richard? Uh -uh. Um prioritize the implementation plan for this wonderful agenda. There, uh, there's, there's so many, there are so many good things in this that um, I, I, I think we will, we will be more successful if you can put them in priority order. Understood. I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons they weren't prioritized is that the funding streams are so very different and uh, who might get at these are so very different that we wanted to make the menu for folks. But understood. absolutely, I, I, I fully support it. But uh, but but since uh, life is short, it would be uh, a wish list. Uh, it, it, it would be good to uh, prioritize. All right, Stephen. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of providing preventative care versus sick care. And when I look at my population, I need to have uh, real data about how I can prevent patients uh, from getting into this, having to need uh, opioids and having to need uh, treatment for opioid uh, disorder. So uh, I really need the best, uh, I need to have prioritized and great data on how to prevent uh, patients from ever having to enter the system. Okay. And Carlos, uh, the last time we had one of these, I was unable to attend and you had to carry the whole thing. So this was my payback time. <laughs> Did you have any, uh, any uh, comments or questions that you'd like to uh, throw out to take us out here? 
I was amazed that you asked exactly the same questions I would have asked. So our minds work exactly alike. So thanks for, for doing it the way I would have done it. Great, thanks. I think that's the end of our, our piece today, but we do have something else coming up, correct? Thanks so much, Kelly, Carlos, and, and the rest of our, our panelists for a really engaging session. Um, we are at the end of our program for today, so we will um, just conclude with, um, with a few thoughts. So I'll go ahead and, and share those, and um, we'll turn it over to Dr. Zhao as well uh, to share his closing comments, and, and then we'll wrap up today's session. Um, I would like to conclude by extending a very sincere and special thank you to all of our presenters, um, our reactors, and to all of our webinar attendees for taking the time to join us today. Um, today's sessions have touched upon um, some really important focus areas um, as we look at um, a look at the crisis moving forward. Um, and of course, we open the day today with uh, some very powerful remarks from our, our keynote speaker who um, really laid out a call to action for, um, for the healthcare community to actively address um, the structural and, and root causes of, um, of racism and, and adverse health outcomes. And I think across all of our sessions today, we have uh, really touched upon um, where some of those interactions are um, with health disparities and critical gaps in care um, and the need to incorporate social determinants into um, our health interventions. Um, another theme, of course, was the need to empower and directly engage individuals, families, and communities um, across the continuum of care um, for both substance use as well as pain management. And um, lastly, through the presentations today, I think it's also evident um, that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted individuals with substance use disorder and pain. Um, and our solutions need to take uh, both that into account, um, as well as the changes that we've um, experienced and how care is delivered. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Zhao to share his thoughts, and then I'll go ahead and close out the symposium. Dr. Zhao. Uh, thank you, Aisha. I actually would like to first turn to John and Ruth, my co-chair, see if they have any thoughts before I close. So John, over to you. Well, thanks, Victor. And uh, let me just um, uh, say, um, first and foremost, uh, big thanks to all the presenters. I thought that was an absolutely spectacular uh, set of presentations today and uh, a lot for us to contemplate. Um, I, I believe that two years ago, uh, we, we asked the question, would there be something worth doing? Would there be things that would be actionable? Would there be activities and learnings that would make a difference? And uh, after hearing what we heard today, uh, I feel that's an enthusiastic yes. Uh, I also uh, heard that, um, uh, that um, knowing what we need to do and actually uh, leading to, um, uh, to, to meaningful change uh, is a, a task ahead. And I think Andre and others really challenged us to that. So I think um, uh, we've got our work cut out as um, uh, a steering committee and as a larger group uh, to really uh, address not only the core topic of um, uh, substance use, but um, uh, the broader context, uh, which is what makes this so vexing, the, the challenges of interprofessional um, uh, learning, the, the interfaces between professional and non-professional care providers, um, the meaningful engagement of persons with lived experience, uh, and the broader social context, um, which is defined by such vexing challenges. Uh, so this is a big task, but uh, biting it into meaningful chunks, as um, our Rich Platt just um, uh, admonished us, I, I think is, um, uh, is, is, is worthy and uh, will yield uh, important dividends for an important um, uh, topic. Thanks. Ruth? Yes, sir. Let me just uh, echo, first of all, John's comments of thanks to the presenters, thanks to the National Academy staff, particularly Aisha. This has been an incredibly rich set of conversations today, really incredibly rich and thoughtful and I think productive I think what comes across clearly is that over the last two years, the collaborative has produced some incredibly important and potentially impactful work. I think the question now and what we need to focus on is how do we take that work, prioritize some things and figure out how to implement them, how to take action and make it really happen. And even beyond that, in a sense, broaden the scope of how do we take what we've done, the lessons learned, um, the work that we've produced, and perhaps 
broaden the scope to think about how we create out of all of this something that we can build on a broader structure that would be useful in addressing all SUDs, not just necessarily opioids. I think there's a lot that we can take away from what we've heard today. So thank you again to everybody. It's an incredible group. Uh, it's been a great two years and we've got a lot more to do and we're gonna do it. Dr. Zhao. So thank you. I, I want to join my co-chairs and uh, everyone to say what a wonderful meeting this has been. You know, I think that uh, the conversation today is so timely because as you will hear, we're going to renew this initiative for the next two years. So some of the comments made, particularly as Richard Platt, my good friend said, implement is something we need to start thinking about since we've been working on all these great ideas. We're moving on with conceptual papers and things like that with the journey map. And maybe this is the time when we can say, how can we really take it to the patients and community? So we'll be talking a lot about that tomorrow, about where we do next. And today's meeting is really rich in informing our decisions for the next phase. So thank you very much. And thank you, Aisha. Thank you all so much. Um, just a couple of quick reminders and then we'll go ahead and, and close out today. Um, just another thank you for your participation, um, as well as a reminder that this webinar has been recorded. In the coming days, you will be able to view the recording um, and the working group slides at nam.edu slash opioid collaborative. That's all we have for you today. Thank you all so much. Please stay safe and healthy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.